It's Friday, Buzz City. We have a big weekend ahead of us. Tonight we're taking on the New York Knicks here at Spectrum Center. It's Muggsy Bogues night. It's the night we've all been waiting yep. for, it seems like, for a handful of days. And so it's finally here. Looking forward to it. I'm Erin Pitsenperger for Hornets.com. That's Matt Ruchinski, and this is the HornetsFanshop.com pregame show. All right, Matt, we have a game day special. What you got for us? Usually I got a mouthful. This one's easy. 20% <laughs> off sweaters and sweatshirts. No code necessary. Right now, get on HornetsFanshop.com. 20% off on everything to keep you warm in these cold winter months as we approach the holiday. There you go. All right, Matt. Well, we are on a three-game winning streak yep. right now, looking to make it four tonight. I kind of want to take back, uh, take a look back at Wednesday night's game against the Detroit Pistons. I want to not talk about the first, what, Three first quarter, three, and a half three quarters. quarter, yeah. First three and a half quarters, actually more than that. Let's just talk about the last five seconds of that Pistons game. Take me through what you, what was going through your head. I mean, everybody in the building, everybody watching the game at home, was probably thinking the same thing I was thinking. Kemba's shooting his ball. It's gonna happen. <laughs> and when he drove and got converged on, and you're thinking, okay, he's gonna throw up what might be not the best shot. I was absolutely amazed to see him pass the ball. I mean, what a great decision by Kemba Walker. He admits it wasn't the best pass in the world. Jeremy Lamb, great job handling the pass. And then he hits the shot, and the place just goes insane. Everybody's going insane. Think we've got the game winner, and then, oh, wait a minute. Why are the refs talking? <laughs> what is happening here? They're just probably just guessing two or three. No. That's what I was thinking. Had the technical fall, and, and, and thankfully things worked out. Only one shot. Hornets get a huge win to start the homestand. Huge win. Really looking forward to it. Yeah. Yesterday, the guys were so, or they were having a blast at practice yesterday. I know Biz Malik, you know, they, they, they weren't really, you know, <laughs> too excited to talk with the media. But at the same time, you know, they were like, you know, that could have cost us the game. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm really glad, you know, moving forward, this I know now, looking up at the clock, right. is crucial and extremely important. But seeing that UConn do at the very end there, yeah. that, that was awesome to see. And I was talking to Kemba after the game, you know, he instills so much trust in mm -hmm. Jay Lamb and it was it was really great to see that play follow through and we're gonna have a guest on the show later who is no stranger to that UConn duo <laughs> because they faced him in the NCAA tournament way back uh, but now looking forward ahead tonight we're taking on the Knicks yep. we're looking for a four game winning streak we saw them on Sunday what did you like from that game and what can we bring to the table tonight the energy and aggressiveness we came out against the Knicks and tried to own that game from the opening tip Let's do that again this time. Let's not wor not worry about those first three and three quarter quarters or last five seconds of the game, and let's own this one from start to finish. I want to see the Hornets get off to a fast start behind that duo of Kemba and Jay Lamb. They're playing amazing right now. Keep riding those guys as long as we can. Kemba and Jay Lamb. Well, let's take a look at those highlights from Wednesday night when they won that game for us. Shooting the basketball is the only thing the world does with Nick Batum with the left hand of his own. Well, there's a left hand that we like, so Bernard and Miles Bridges. Both those guys, huh? It's not the lamp. His turn to get in the paint. Bounce pass to Cody Bellinger. Uh, Horns doing a good job of driving the basketball. G probably brings in Miles Bridges. Yes, sir. Oh, Billy got right to the rail. How did Detroit lose track of it in the second quarter? So Billy Hernan Gomez and Frank Kaminsky playing together. Oh, oh they bump! Beautiful find, but two caught right at the rim. This backdoor cut of Malik as Calderon was caught watching the basketball. <laughs> he knows right away he's a trump. Six assists in the first half, two of the second, but that was the biggest one right there. Trust, commitment by Jeremy Lamb to get the shot off, and you make the right play, and that's what it's all about, trusting your teammates. I'm telling you, Jeremy Lamb let that one go. I can tell by the bounce in his step after the shot was off. He knew it was in, and his teammates got a little overzealous with the celebration there, and also the point, but still, what a fabulous grinding out gut win 
We're now joined by assistant coach Ron Nord. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. Well, this is your first time here on the pregame show. We've kind of had a good run the last couple of shows with assistant coaches. So you're right here. You're Thanks right for up putting next. the pressure on me. Yeah. <laughs> See, you can yeah. put the pressure on the players. We're going to put the pressure yeah, on right. you. There you go. Exactly. Try right. not to screw this up. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Well, this is the first time that we're sitting down with you. So for the fans who aren't familiar with you and how you got here to be an assistant coach here, take us through your path to get here. Um, I played in college, got to play for the Celtics coach, uh, Brad Stevens. And honestly, when he got the Celtics job, he was kind of my entry in the NBA. And uh, so I worked there for, for two years. Um, I actually left the NBA for a year and coached college. Realized I didn't want to coach college. I wanted to come back to the NBA and was really fortunate to get a job. Um, in Brooklyn with their G League team. Um, Sean Marks and Trajan Langdon hired me there. Um, and a connection from there um, connected me with Coach Borrego and um, was really, really fortunate to be here. I was excited to be here and it's, it's been good so far. Now, a fun little story that you guys might not know. He did mention that he, he was with Brad Stevens. He was with Brad Stevens at Butler during the two Cinderella stints in the NCAA tournament where he went up against Kemba Walker in the final. So, how is it right now with Kemba? I can, always, I can see you shaking your it's head. It's right good now. now, I guess. Uh, so Kemba and I have actually, we played against each other three times growing up. We played against each other twice in AAU when we were young, I think 15 and 16 years old, and then we played each other in the national championship game. All three went in Kemba's favor. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the old the old saying, if you can't beat him, join him, like that, <laughs> that really happened here. Like, if I can't beat Kemba, I'll just <laughs> win with him, I guess, you know? Uh, but. Him and, and Lamb was on the team too, so they give me crap all the time. <laughs> Lamb, when I first got here, Lamb was just kind of lifting in the weight room, and I walked in. He goes, Ron, how you doing? I was like, I'm good. He's like, oh, I was just, you know, last night I was watching the 2011 National Championship game. I'm like, <laughs> why, why would you say that? <laughs> well, that being said, you know, you are among one of the youngest. We're not sure who the youngest assistant coach is in the league, but you're 28 years old right now. How is it being an assistant coach and working with these players who are the same age as you, some of them older yeah. and younger? How's, what's that like? Um, no, it's it's good. You know, I've, I'm, I'm really blessed to be able to be here. Um, you know, I've worked hard, but I've, I've had a lot of people pull me in along the way um, and it's been it's been really cool to be in this position um, the players are great you know I, I learned really from Brad when he took over in uh, in Boston he was he was young as well um, and I just learned from him if you work hard if you have an idea about what you talk about what you're talking about and if you just buy into the players and show that you're there for them then they'll, they'll buy into you so I try to live by those all the time you know and I try to you know I'm young like these guys, so I actually don't do social media anymore, but I used to and grow up, you know, mm -hmm. grew up in the same kind of things that they've seen. So being able to connect in that way, you know, it's pretty cool. Now, I'm going to ask you a question that obviously comes from internet research, so if I'm wrong, you just tell me I'm wrong <laughs> and this is not correct. But when you came out of high school and were going, picking your colleges, you had a chance to go to Harvard on yeah, an academic accurate. scholarship? Is this well, true? Not academic, but, you know, the Ivy League doesn't offer athletic scholarships, okay. so it was going to have to be some type of academic assistance okay. uh, to get me to go play basketball there and yeah I mean I got an offer to go play there and my grandmother was not very happy that I <laughs> didn't choose she was upset no she was legit when I called her and told her I, I had committed to Western Kentucky out mm -hmm. of uh, out of high school right. initially before the coach left and I went to Butler but when I told her I, I was committing to West Kentucky she literally yelled at me she was mad that I didn't choose Harvard wow. so well, I mean I just kind of understand that I guess a little bit yeah, so, smart. so smart that the man turned down Harvard <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's yeah that's where we're gonna spin this that's right. sometimes that's where we're gonna spin this that's right why Butler then what was it about Butler that made you go there was it when you finally had a chance to talk to Brad yeah I mean I think at the end of the day so Brad Brad had recruited me right when he got the head coaching job at Butler he was only 30 uh, it was just crazy He's two years older than I yeah. am now uh, he was the head coach at Butler and you know the thing that I had heard about him um, was that he was a really really good person and that he was a family man and those values were important to him as well as competing and winning and you know Butler was a good school academically and I felt like those two combined, like I just couldn't go wrong. Um, you know, I was going to be with good people. I was going to get a good education. And, and Butler basketball was good. They had, you know, uh, won the preseason IT. They had been in the NCAA tournament. So I was getting everything. I actually, I was born in Indy. My family lives in Indianapolis. And so all those kind of together was like, it's a no-brainer. And it turned out to be 
a million times better than I could have imagined. So was grandma happy you stayed at least close to home when you decided? Yeah, to so I was actually, uh, yeah, so when I, when I decided to go to Butler, she was ecstatic because literally Butler, my, my first dorm was on 44th Street in Butler. Mm -hmm. My grandmother stayed on 40th Street. So oh, wow. it was like oh, that's four blocks, uh -huh. you know, just north of her. So she was happy. When you were a player, did you ever envision yourself becoming a coach? Yeah, actually, that's, that's all I wanted to do. I didn't, I didn't want to play. I knew in high school I wanted to coach. I thought in college if I had a chance to play in the NBA that I would do it, but I realized pretty early on that I didn't have a chance. So um, I actually told Brad um, after my sophomore year that I wanted to coach. He started just like giving me little things my next two years, uh, junior and senior year, to kind of begin the coaching process. I was coaching AAU while I was playing. I would go play in the NCAA tournament on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I would come back and coach an AAU tournament like the oh, next day, uh, <laughs> which, which is a lot of fun. But um, yeah, I kind of knew I wanted to do this. I didn't want to go overseas. My body's not great, so I didn't want to go over there and be hurt and, you know, be away from home and things yeah. like that. So coaching was a no-brainer for me. So you said Brad took you under his wing. He, he taught you a couple of things. Now, looking back, what are the biggest nuggets of information that you've taken with you this entire time? Man, I think, you know, just number one, his preparation and his organization, I think is really, really, I think it's at a high level. I mean, I think, you you know, we watch him draw plays out of timeouts and everyone's like, he's got the best plays. He's really organized and he's really prepared throughout the point, throughout the game. Um, that's something that I learned. Um, and then the other thing is just being humble. Like, he's the most humble person I've ever been around in my life. Like, when he got, when he went from Butler to the Celtics, he became more humble. Like, I, I don't know how that's possible. You know, you uh -huh. become the head coach, one of the best franchises in the world and you're more humble. Um, so, and being a servant leader, like just buying into people, like working hard for people, those kind of things, like, you know, taking yourself out of the equation and just focusing on other people. I try to do that every day. I'm not always great at it, but I try and, you know, I think it's what makes him special. Like you mentioned, one of those chances that he gave you was the chance to coach with the main Red Claws in the G League. You also coach for another team in the G League. Having that G League experience, every coach is different for how they get here. How much did that G League experience really benefit you? Completely invaluable. Like, I think I was 23 when I was an assistant in the G League. So to be able to work with professional players, you know, it's different than working with college players. Like, we don't. We don't have these guys on scholarships, so you have to figure out a way to communicate with these guys, get these guys to do what you want them to do without like beating them over the head all the time and making them do it. Um, so to be able to learn that and be put in the fire at that age at that time was huge for me in Maine. And then, you know, when Trajan and Sean hired me um, in Brooklyn to coach uh, the Long Island Nets, you know, it was it was pretty much a startup company because it was the first year that the team had ever, you know, um, been a team and an organization. And to be a head coach and to have all these great, you know, as an assistant, you have all these great ideas. You're like, when I'm a head coach, I'll do this and this. And I had these ideas, and my first game, we got beat by 30. <laughs> you know, and it was like immediate humbling, like right, very first game. Um, and we were 17 and 33 my first year there. So to learn how to, like, deal with that and our players, you know, like, you know, how to deal with difficult situations and moments, that was really, really big for me. And, um, you know, especially at the age I am, to, to have those feet in the fire, I, I wouldn't be anything without that G League experience. We've seen you out on the court working with these guys. We have you sitting down on the show right now. One thing that is evident is the passion and the fire that you have when you're out on the court, when you're talking basketball, anything like that. How much does that really benefit you when you're working with these guys to, to see that fire? That yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's been times in my life where I'm like, I need to dial it back a little bit. But at the end of the day, it's, it, it, it's who I am, you know. And I think, you know, another thing I learned from Brad is you have to, you have to be yourself and you have to coach the way that you coach. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing I try to do is to just give energy to people, you know, the best I can. And, you know, just be a giver. And I think energy is one thing that you can give to people constantly, at least for me. And so working with these guys, having fun, you know, the season's long. So if we don't have fun and we're not laughing and, you know, having a good time, then, you know, it's what's the point you know so um i try to do that the best i can i have a lot of fun coaching i love doing this i love being with people uh basketball is that avenue that i get to use to do that you're talking about bringing energy to the table and we've talked with the players before about you know how has this new coaching staff been how has this been for you having a handful of new coaches all come together it's not necessarily the same as players coming together trying to be a force on the court but it's more so like how do we come together as a coaching staff and make sure that we have the message relayed to the players i think i think you know especially as a coach and for coach borrego like there's nothing more important than your staff and the people that he's hired Probably, you know, I'm, I'm going to exclude myself because I don't want to think, say that I'm great. But <laughs> man, he's hired a, he's hired, <laughs> he's hired, he's hired, he hired a great staff. Like the people that we get to work with, that I get to work with on a daily basis from the coaching staff are great. They all have, you know, really good backgrounds in basketball. They all know the game well and they work at it. Um, and everyone's still trying to get better. Um, 
But like you said, that cohesion is good. And I think, you know, Coach Borrego decided to hire people that he felt like were going to work well together, maybe even over like the most experienced people in the world. Um, and I think at the end of the day, like you need that cohesion because the players see that. The players watch how we interact with one another. They see how we are on the bench when difficult things are happening in the game. And, you know, it directly translates to how they, to how they work together as a unit. So um, it's been cool. I'm really thankful that I get to be a part of it. Now you mentioned they get to see your reaction on the court. <laughs> Let's go back a couple days ago to the Pistons game. Couple seconds left on the clock. Last shot. Kemba sends it over to Jay Lamb for the shot. We look over and we see you going crazy. What was going through your mind at that moment? Uh, I saw Biz. <laughs> Not to throw Biz under the bus, but I think we all saw him. I saw Biz run to half court. In the Biz's defense, like, you know, when big shots are made, you feel right. like it's like either the team's going to call a timeout or the game's over. Right. So Biz is at half court celebrating the win. And I looked up and I saw 0.3 seconds on the clock. I'm like, they're going to throw it in and we're going to get a technical. And sure enough, <laughs> they threw it in and we got a technical. So I thought yeah. he was reacting to the shot. I thought he was just <laughs> thrilled, man. I, the look on your face yeah. was tremendous. No, I was more nervous. <laughs> how, how big of a win was that for this team and how much did that team need this heading into this? It was the opening game of this five-game homestand. Yeah, huge win. Um, you know, I think our home crowd has been great all year. Um, to start this homestand, especially after December, like we're going to be gone a lot. Um, it's huge for us against a, a really good Detroit team that you know they haven't they haven't won games lately, but really started the season well mm -hmm. and are really talented. Um, you know, hopefully that energy carries over to these next couple games. But man, if we can just do that one game at a time over the next five games, I think we'll be in pretty good shape. And you guys just saw this Knicks team a few days ago. What do you expect tonight? I mean, they're young. I was um, I was at their game the night before ours in New York the other night when they played Brooklyn, and these guys play hard. Um, obviously, they beat some pretty good teams this season. Um, you know, we can't feel like this is a game that we just walk in and get. Um, we have to either match or beat their energy. Excuse me, we have to play as hard as they do. Um, and then if we execute like we did there in New York defensively, move the ball offensively, like we feel pretty good about our chances, but we have to do it. All right, Ron, before we close tonight is Muggsy Bogues night. And we're celebrating the classic court and everything. And we're honoring Muggsy as a player and who he was for a Hornet. For a point guard, a former point guard, what did you notice from Muggsy, maybe when you were growing up, yeah. anything in particular that kind of stuck with you about him? I mean, so I've met Muggsy once or twice. I think just once, maybe at training camp. And, you know, obviously Muggsy's small. Walking by him, I didn't realize how small he really is. <laughs> And, you know, as a small guy myself, like, I'm, I'm 5'11". I wrote six feet when I was in college, but I'm 5'11", <laughs> maybe 5'10". There it is. That's what I was waiting for. Yeah. Um, you know, as a small guy, just his toughness and his relentlessness to just keep going in there with those big guys, um, man, it takes a lot. You know, it takes a lot. We see it with Kimba every day. Like, it takes a lot of pounding on your body over and over again to compete with these guys. I mean, everyone's huge. Um, so, so much respect for him and his toughness and, you know, just how he just continued to just fight through over and over again. And obviously his talent was just superb. Um, you know, but as a small guy, like growing up watching that, like, I thought I had a chance. I didn't realize I wasn't anywhere near as good as Muggsy, but I thought I had a chance. So thanks, Muggsy. <laughs> well, awesome, Ron. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thanks. All right, we're going to close out by taking a look at Muggsy Bogues and celebrating his time here with the Hornets in our 30th anniversary special. Tonight, 7 o'clock tip. Tune in on Fox Sports Southeast or listen on WFNZ if you can't be here at Spectrum Center. For Ron Norad and Matt Ruchinski, I'm Aaron Pitsenberger for Hornets.com. Muggsy, it, <laughs> you, you look at him and you, you see in, in stature, he's small. But at the same time, man, this kid, he, he had a heart of a, a lion. He, had a, he, you know, he went out there and he laid it all out on the line. And being able to play with him, it was, it was fun. Because every night, I'd admire what he was doing. Muggsy was the smallest, fiercest player that I've ever seen. He had every reason to play with a chip on his shoulder. There's a lot of people, including his second NBA coach, Dick Carter, said he shouldn't be in the game because he's five foot three. How am I supposed to play a game with a guy this height? He played much bigger. He was much bigger in terms of his uh, stature. He was the smallest guy on the court, but he played like the biggest guy on the court. You know, he played with the most heart, you know, and that five foot three, the way that he could do things and, and how fast he was and, his speed, I mean, first and foremost, uh, his feet. His, I've never seen anybody with better feet. Little undersized, but fast, and bringing the, the ball up the floor. 
I was in love with small, fast point guards. And Muggsy and I were a perfect uh, combo as far as uh, the guy that I wanted to run our team. He was a spark plug. I mean, I, <laughs> man, he had to be one of the fastest guys in the league. And, and I'm talking about this is with and without the basketball. So Muggsy, obviously, the heart of that guy to be five foot three and play in the NBA. Um, can't tell you how big a heart he has and how competitive he was, uh, how he could read everything on the floor, time and score. His basketball IQ was far and beyond that of most NBA players. He understood the game, you know, and he understood exactly where you needed to be uh, because he's a general, you know, he's a point guard. He used to always, <laughs> you guys couldn't hear him say this, but he used to always say on the court, come on, honey, come on, honey. He always, he called everybody honey. You know, I think Muggsy kind of, kind of gave us our, a little bit of our, our identity. That scrapper intensity. Okay, we may not be the most talented group, but if we go out and we play to the best of our ability every night, we can get something done. His competitive spirit. I mean, bigger than everyone's. You were never gonna punk Muggs. Muggsy Bogues wasn't trapped in a five foot three body. He almost cherished it worshipped it. It became something that motivated him. I gotta go for it. He was a pest defensively and he bothered people. There were so many players in the league that hated bringing the ball up the court against Muggsy. His low center of gravity and he used to be a wrestler and he was getting in and stealing the ball and move his feet really well and quick. Nobody wanted to bring the ball up against Muggsy. You know, it's amazing when you have that 24 second shot clock and you have somebody pressuring you for 10 or 15 seconds of those shot clock, how, how well our defense was because he was able to take so much time off the clock. You know, teams couldn't get in their offense when he really wanted to disrupt them. It's not like you could say, oh, he's little, we're going to throw him. No, he was so little and strong, he'd root you out to, you know, 15 or 16 feet before you caught the ball, and now you're not in the post anymore. Very difficult to play against him. Uh, you know, playing against uh, some bigger and taller guys, it was very difficult to, uh, uh, for those guys to find the, the body and uh, uh, check him out. I think the, the thing that makes Muggsy su such a, a unique uh, player is the fact that, you know, he's, he's been used to hearing how small he, 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 he is. And I, th I felt that he used that to his advantage. You know, make a, it doesn't make a difference your size. He showed that, you know, you could be big, you could be small, and still uh, there's a place for you in this game. When bigger guards post him up, uh, his teammates would say, Muggsy, you need any help? He said, nope. He's just as unaccustomed to doing this as I am. If he backed you down into the post. And uh, he was right. Oftentimes, many players say, the worst thing about Muggsy Bogues is when you can't see him. Because that means he's, in your, he's soon to get in your grill or steal something out of your back pocket. He, you know, he wasn't worried about you know, b being the, the guy with the most points or being the star on the team or a guy in the paper. Uh, he just wanted to, to, to lead his team, uh, to make sure he got the assist to help, help you score as easily and as quickly as you could. I remember him basically taking me under his wing and just telling him, like, young fella, all I want you to do is run. Don't let me beat you down the court. You know, and he was serious. He said, I'll find you, just run. I owe a lot to Muggsy because Muggsy gave me an opportunity to go out there and get extra shots. Because if it wasn't for his pinpoint passes, probably would have been a little more of a struggle. All of us did whatever Muggsy said on the floor. He was the general. Uh, we trusted him with the ball. But I knew if, if the ball was coming my way, I'm not to dribble. He's only going to throw it to me when I'm open and, and catch and shoot because he wanted to assist. If, if I had to pump fake and put it on the floor for an escape dribble, why are you dribbling the ball? It's the first thing, whether the shot went in or not. Why are you dribbling the ball? I'm giving it to you so you don't have to dribble. That guy was funny, man, but he was, he was, he was competitive, the leader of our group. Um, we trusted him with, with anything. He would penetrate, you know, uh, and it's hard to believe that he would go into those trees. He would, I mean, as small as he was, he would get into those trees 
And then the plays that he would make were, uh, were phenomenal for a guy his size to be able to see guys, have the court vision that he had, you know. So it was very fun playing with Bugsy. Muggsy was the heart of the team for a long time. I mean, all the players respected him. He played hard. You know, he was an underdog, even though he never carried himself like an underdog. He was only an underdog in other people's eyes, not his own. And, um, you know, to be a starting point guard for all those years, I think, says a tremendous amount about his competitiveness, his toughness. He was going to go out there and give his all. He was going to work hard. Um, I got to spend a lot of time with Muggsy between year one and year two. Muggsy would come into the Grady Cole Center uh, off Kings and he would come in and put up shots every day and I would rebound for him and he got better. He worked hard, he, he improved his game. He was just, his character, his temperament, he loved to play, he was a fierce competitor, but uh, you know, it, it was fun playing with him. Little guy but with a big personality. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to play with, you know, with him and Larry who, you know, both had a, a zest for life, just a zest for the game. They enjoyed it and, you know, Muggsy was a huge impact. He was a great teammate. I mean, we would laugh, you know, he's, he's you know, outside of Shaquille O'Neal, Muggsy was probably one of the funniest guys, you know, in the league. I mean, he was always joking, always in a great mood. I mean, he is a lot of times, sometimes guys would be down, but then Muggsy was always making sure he was that one guy that, you know, that went over there and made sure that, you know, everything was okay. He was our leader. On the floor, I, I remember I was having a good game. Uh, was, had made a few in a row. And coming down the floor, he would just, directions. He's, he's always pointing, not saying a lot. Go this way. I come off a screen, not open. He's still dribbling the ball. Go back that way. Get him again. He's, he's just... Well, whatever he could do to get me a shot, but that's just how he was. He's really a, a fun-loving, exuberant guy, so he was, he was also the guy keeping us light, you know, keeping us smiling, keeping us joking. Muggs had a lot of charisma. He really did. You know, people gravitated towards Muggsy because he was small, you know, and traditionally speaking, basketball players were tall and they stood out. Muggsy blended right on in. You know, he was the average height of your NBA fan. People loved him. Kids love Muggsy. They really did. Go Muggsy! Yeah. Our, our families were so close. Uh, our kids grew up together. We lived, you know, cat a corner from each other at, at Strawberry Hill. And our kids, first two kids, are about the same age. Our wives got along together, well together. I remember I I, uh, I, I put on a Barney suit at Muggsy's daughter's uh, eighth birthday or something because he rented a, a Barney suit, but it was way too big for him. So he calls me, he goes, Dell, I need you to fill in getting this Barney suit. Absolutely, man, we had fun with it. Until one of my kids, I obviously looked around the party and went, my dad's not here. And he, Dad, are you in that Barney suit? Get out of here, boy. <laughs> one of our first practices or games, I don't remember which it was, but I take my uh, player down below the basket and I flash right in front of him and I'm wide open. I got my hands wide open. If you did that playing with magic, you were going to get the basketball. But I looked up at Muggsy who had the ball and I was between him and the defender and I couldn't even see Muggsy. So I knew he couldn't see me. So I go like, okay, I've got to find another way to get the ball from Muggsy. But uh, we ended up having a great chemistry and the fact that he could, you know, get by people and dart by people and pass the basketball, make some shots. Really tough player. He was tough as nails too. One day we're we're in Portland at at, at a practice at a practice. We're about to play the Trailblazers the next day. Jr. popped him with a towel. Muggsy used to wrestle when he was young, and Jr. was always on Muggs about how little he was. Jr. Reed, who's six foot nine, two hundred seventy pounds, says to Muggsy that you cannot. If I wrestle you, I'll pin you. Muggsy said, "Oh, really?" They're both looking at each other, and we're all just at our de at our chairs, like, "What? Well, how's this gonna go down?" Before we knew it, Muggsy was behind Jr. Picked him up and dropped him right on his head. <laughs> Muggsy pins Jr. Reed and does not let him off of the floor because at five foot three, when he's on the floor, I mean, he's pretty much got the leverage on you. That told me right there how tough Muggsy Bogues was. And Muggsy wrestled in high school, but that was the last time. 
JR. We lost it. Guys are running around. Mugs didn't break, didn't break a smile. Can you imagine JR Reed not being able to get up <laughs> floor with Muggsy Bogues on top of him? Yeah, that's how tough Muggsy Bogues was. If you didn't know any better, you would think that it was impossible. But I got an opportunity to see it night in and night out. And I realized that that was just hard work and his determination to get it done despite his size. He was the catalyst of, of what turned an expansion franchise into a playoff team. People dotted him at every corner, and he showed, you can win with me leading your team. And that's what he did.